Hey Bulldogs, Chris Bryant, CCIE 12933 here, and something for everybody today in this video, CCNA and CCNP candidates alike, especially those of you working on the route and T-shoot exams, because we're going to perform some route redistribution on live Cisco routers and also see routing loops actually occur. And especially if you use CCNAers, you need to see these routing loops. Even if the route redistribution is more of a CCNP topic, you'll still enjoy seeing this in action and pick up a few exam tips for your future studies. But also, you're taught about avoiding routing loops and split horizon and some other techniques we use to avoid them, but you don't really see one. And if you don't see one and you don't know when it's happening, then it's really impossible to troubleshoot it, right? So I'm going to show you one occurring here live and also how simple it can be, unfortunately, to get one when you're performing route redistribution. It is something we have to be concerned about. Let me show you the subnets real quick that we're going to use in this lab. And if you want to write these down, that's great. Just pause the video for a moment. And if you don't, that's okay too, because you're going to see, especially the pertinent Ethernet segment and that router for loop back, you're going to see that throughout the lab. Let me show you the topology and also for you CCNPers, this is in my CCNP route study guide, along with a lot of other great uh, information about route redistribution and plenty of labs there. Let me bring up a larger drawing for you. And we've got our usual frame relay cloud between routers 1, 2, and 3. We also have an Ethernet segment between routers 2 and 3. So it looks like router 2 can get information two different ways in that segment, maybe from router 1 and from router 3. And we also have an OSPF area 0 between routers 3 and 4. And we are advertising, hopefully, this loopback network into router 4. That's the one we're really watching during this route redistribution. So instead of saying hopefully, let's bring the pod up and the first thing we do before we ever start redistribution and do not laugh is make sure that on the border router you have the route or routes that you're trying to redistribute in the first place. And I know that sounds funny. It's like, well, yeah, of course I have it or I wouldn't be doing it. Believe me, just run a show IP route and make sure you've got it. It can save you a lot of unnecessary troubleshooting later on. I have not done the redistribution yet, so we're going to go over a couple of good exam tips for you here as well. And let's start with RIP. What do I have to be concerned with as far as route, uh, redistribution into RIP? What do I need to set there? Well, I need to set a seed metric, and we call it, it's a kind of starter metric for the route, and let's see exactly why. And you can see it right here with this OSPF route. We know the first number in the brackets is the AD, that's 110. The second is the cost of the route in OSPFEs, and that's 65. Well, RIP considers a route with a metric of 16 to be unreachable. So if we try to give it a metric, uh, or a route with a metric of 65, I mean, it's going to have a nervous breakdown. It's not going to know what to do with that. So it's just going to say immediately, you know what, I don't even understand what you're talking about. I don't want that. So we have to tell RIP, hey, here's a metric for these routes that we're re redistributing that you can understand. It is a starter metric or technically called a seed metric. And one way to set that is with the default metric command. And I'm going to give it a default metric of 2. Now let's look at the redistribute commands here. I'm going to do redistribute connected routes, redistribute OSPF1 routes, and redistribute static routes. Now I can promise you that I don't have any static routes on router 3. So why did I do that? You're going to see in a moment. With router OSPF1 here, I don't have to set a seed metric. Because OSPF has a default seed metric of what, CCNP candidates? Tell me what that is. It's 20, right? So it's 20, but what do I kind of have to watch here? Let's say I do a redistribute connected here. That's a legal command in OSPF, but what is it recommended that I put there? Highly recommended. The subnets option. Because if without that, you're not going to get your subnets redistributed into OSPF, and you probably want those. So I will do a redistribute connected subnets and a redistribute RIP subnets. Now the reason I mentioned that redistribute static command that I put under the RIP, route, uh, RIP protocol 
is that I've noticed over the years, especially when people first start working with route redistribution, and believe me, I've been there, it's like I just want to make sure I get all my routes redistributed. So out of habit, you tend to put connected, which is generally a good idea, redistribute static, and then redistribute whatever dynamic routing protocol you're putting there. I would watch putting that redistribute static in there out of habit, because that can cause some issues. Now we've performed our redistribution. Let's go down to router 2, this RIP router, and see if it's getting the route successfully from router 3. And it is. It sees the segment connecting routers 3 and 4, and it also see, sees router 4's loopback. We also know that seeing it is not enough. we got to be able to communicate with it. And to test that basic communication, we'll send a ping, goes through, and everything's fine. Now, it could be days later, it could be weeks later, or it could be months later. But some well-meaning, or maybe even not so well-meaning person comes in and says, you know what, we really need to put a static route on our border router to that loopback. We really need to do that because that's an important route and I don't want to have to depend on a routing protocol. And I know that might not be the soundest argument in the world, but we've all heard worse. So let's assume that they do just that and they put a host route in. But instead of typing the correct next top IP address, they send it up to router one's address on the frame relay network, which is up here to a network that's over here. That doesn't sound good, but again, we've seen worse. So let's put that in there, 172.12.123.1. Well, the router's not going to scream at you or anything like that. There's no error as far as the router's concerned. It's only going to do what you tell it to do. So we now have a static route, and we had the redistribute static command there already. This person configuring this route might not even have seen that. So let's go down to router 2 and see what the impact is. Well, it's no big deal. I mean, the routes are still there, and you can see that we've got all zeros here. That means that the update literally just came in, because, of course, that's going to show you how many, how many seconds in RIP's case it's been since the last update came in. So there's no problem. We see the route in the routing table, and we'll just send another ping. And the ping's not going to go through. Why isn't the ping going through now when we go through just a few minutes ago? Let's look at router 3's routing table. Why did this static route take the place of the OSPF route? Why exactly did that happen? That's the kind of thing we need to know. Why exactly did that happen? It happened because the route was exactly the same. The mask length was exactly the same. So then what's the tiebreaker? administrative distance. And what's the administrative distance of an OSPF route? 110. What's the AD of this route? It's 1. Lowest AD wins. So the static route goes into the routing table. So, you know, that's all fine and dandy and it looked okay as far as router 2 was concerned, but then when it gets to router 3 the packet's taking a wrong turn. The problem would be is if we're at router 2 and we don't know what happened on router 3, maybe we don't even have access to it. All we know is all of a sudden we've got people saying, hey, I can't reach this network. I can't get to my data. Well, pinging is not enough to know what's going on. Pinging just says, hey, there's a problem. But to find out what the problem really is or where it is, you need to run trace route. And this is an example of a routing loop. Because you can see the packets, and we're going to wait till it goes to line 30. Almost there, because that's how far it's going to go. You can see the packets are going to dot 3, router 3's Ethernet 0 interface, with no problem. But then they're just bouncing back and forth. And here they're bouncing back between router 1 serial interface and router 3 serial interface. This is a routing loop in action. Router 1 gets and says, oh, I need to send it to dot 3. Router 3 gets and says, oh, I need to send it up to dot 1. And they're just going back and forth and back and forth. And you'll notice the time continues to increment all the way up here. It's taking longer and longer to get them back because they're just bouncing back and forth. So even if we go to router 1 at this point, router 1 is still showing dot 3 as the next hop. 
and you'll notice it's been three minutes and two seconds since router one got an update on that because what am I about to say about rip it is dog slow convergence man and apologies to all dogs in the world for comparing them to rip it is really slow so let's just say we get the idea of well I'll clear the routing table here nothing wrong with that well the problem is that now router one is seeing dot two router 2 as the next hop to get to that network. So now we've got a real routing loop. And the reason I wanted to show you that is because a routing loop in traceroute may not just show you two IP addresses that it's bouncing back and forth. It could just show you three. This is quite literally a loop because what's happening is the packets are going to router 3, then they're going to router 1, then they're coming back through the cloud to router 2, then they're going back to router 3, back to router 1, back to router 2. Literally a loop in our routing. Because right now the packets that are destined for that loop back are leaving router 2 through the Ethernet, going to router 3. Router 3 looks at its routing table and says, okay, send them up to router 1. Router 1 gets them, looks in its routing table now and says, okay, send it down to router 2. And around and around she goes literally a loop and they have no chance of getting to the correct destination. So that is exactly what a routing loop looks like and how you diagnose it. Now the easiest thing to do here is just to take that route off. Take that static route out of the table because this is the golden rule of networking my friends and a lot of people, I don't say a lot of people, but some people just deny this, okay? But if you just configured something and then something went horribly wrong in your network, it's probably what you just did. Just get it out of there. Just take that static route out. If you were the person who added the static route out and then all of a sudden your phone's going off and people are saying, hey, I can't get to such and such network anymore, first thing I would do is just undo what I just did. So I do that and just that quickly, I hope the OSPF routes back in the table. See? So let's go back down to router 2. And even though router 2 is still going to be showing 120, uh, excuse me, 23.3 is the next hop, this time they should go through and they do. And that's what we want to see. We want to just see it go right through exactly where it's supposed to go and that's it. But again, especially if you use CCNAers, but of course for you NPRs as well, I really want you to see that because you need to know how to detect a routing loop because there was no way to tell what the ping. That wasn't doing the job. That was just saying you have a problem. But traceroute is going to show you exactly where the problem is. And anytime you see this, and it is a little bit of a sickening feeling. Uh, I've been there, especially in an IE lab exercise. I was like, hmm, that doesn't look good. Whenever you see the same two or three or even four or five IP addresses, repeating throughout the trace route, you have a routing loop and now you know how to spot it and also how to get rid of it. Thanks for watching this particular video. Make sure to join me on my YouTube channel and in 2011 we've got several hundred new videos coming for the NA, the new NP exams and also Microsoft and CompTIA. So make sure to subscribe to us there. We'll see you on Twitter and Facebook as well. I'm Chris Bryant, CCIE 12933.